Welcome to Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis. It's great to be with you here today. Hey, today on the show, we've got a great guest, a returning guest. Uh, got him to talk about his first book, his ministry, and that kind of thing. And I'm really excited to have Andrew Isker on the show today. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Chase. Hey, I don't know if you know this, and maybe I mentioned in the first episode, but um, he's one of those accounts on Twitter that I was following, <laughs> and he was posting his sermons um, and it was still pretty a non back then. And so I was like finding your sermons and listening to him. Cause I was like, who is this guy? And I like, could, I was like geographically trying to place you. I was like, maybe he's in the Northeast and he's like going to get canceled. And so I would listen to your sermons and I was like trying to figure out what kind of church you're in, but now you're kind of out in the open. You're, you're, you know, it's not a secret anymore. Um, and now you've written this great book, the Boniface option. Um, highly recommend it to the audience, but I'm excited to have a conversation with you about it. What was really the inspiration with you writing the Boniface option? Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, the inspiration of this book is I, I started to, you know, probably around, you know, well, 2017, I wrote an article, um, about it titled the Boniface option. And, and you're, you're noticing, you know, you're noticing the, uh, radical changes that are happening in the country, um, even, even at that time. And, and even, I didn't have the, you know, the language or the framework for it, you know, until like Aaron Wren wrote about the three worlds of, of evangelicalism, on uh, this paradigm that he, you know, uh, thought up, which is, I think is very accurate. Um, but I could see that, all right, we're in, you know, what we now call negative world. And I could see that most of Christianity most of evangelicalism is not at all prepared to confront what is around them and, and is stuck in this, this neutral world is stuck in this world where, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, living, uh, you know, kind of the, this fat and happy life where things are, things are good. And there, there aren't any major conflicts that we have to address. We just are, we just need to persuade people to, to come to church and be Christians and, and that sort of thing. And it, it became obvious, like, no, after Obergefell and all of the fallout since then, that uh, no, the believing in Jesus comes at a major cost now. And, and the world that we live in is, is not what we think it is. It isn't, we, we have this like baseline assumption that all of the, um, the, the ideologies that surround us and undergird everything is just normal. Uh, it's just the way that, that things are. And we have just ignored it, right? We haven't talked about like, why is our way of life the way that it is? Why are, why are we living this way? Um, which leads to, you know, um, all of the, the perversions and insanity that, that uh, surround us now, like how did it get to this? And so now I think we're at a, we're at a moment, um, you know, five or six years later where you can't ignore uh, the, the cultural devastation that has occurred. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about this for years, um, just, just about our culture generally and all of the, the problems and, and issues and, and, uh, and things we don't think about and thinking, okay, how do I, how do I take what I'm seeing, which I can see, but like nobody else can at all, <laughs> Sure, right? They, they're just oblivious to all of it. How do I communicate um, what I'm seeing and put it in language that people can understand that no, things are bad and they're way worse than you realize. And, and then be able to, um, to really uh, reorient yourself to a, a, a stance of confrontation of it, both on an individual level and on a corporate level um, as at the church at large, right? How do we, how do, what do we do? Right. How do we collectively uh, fight these things? How do you fight them in your individual life? Um, and, and this world that, that exists around us, what, what, what things can be done. And so that was, yeah, the, really the major inspiration is like me, <laughs> I'm seeing all of this and I, and I, and you feel almost like Cassandra, right. From, from, um, you know, ancient Greek literature where it's like, I see all of the stuff happening and no one else does. And everyone thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> no so kidding. It's like, how do you, how do you uh, communicate this for uh, the regular person? Yeah. And I think that was really helpful. And that's what I resonate with in book. Cause I, I feel like that often, you know, when I'm, I'm talking to other Christians in, in my context or just other pastors, when I was in Acts 29, I'd be saying all this stuff and they'd be looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, 
I'm not crazy, right? I'm not crazy. <laughs> I know. And like, I read this book and I'm like, see, I'm not crazy. Like other people are seeing it too. So I was really thankful for that. One of the hurdles that I think some people are going to have with the book is your use of kind of lingo, um, like trash world and bug man. So just for, for somebody who's, you know, hopefully going to purchase the book, give them a primer. What is, when you use the word trash world, what are you describing there? Yeah. So I'm, I'm it, trash world really is this, um, hyper consumeristic world where it's, it's, uh, totally individualistic where it, it conditions, um, men to be totally atomized, uh, to be isolated, to be alone and, and to view their existence really as, um, uh, for the purpose of, of consuming entertainment, consuming, you know, food, um, e easily consumable things, um, and just consuming, 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 right? That's, that's why you exist in order to, to watch Netflix and eat, eat, uh, fast food and, and, you know, watch, watch football and enjoy, enjoy these little things and, and toil away in your job to, to get to enjoy the things you're allowed to have and, and to have no other aspirations, um, beyond that to have no, to have no I, identity, um, no, no collective understanding of, of who you are, where you came from and what your, your purpose is in, in the world. Um, and, um, it, it's, you know, trash world really is, I mean, you could, you could put it in like the, these, you know, meta political narratives, you know, of, of like globalism. And it, it really is the ideal globalist citizen where you're not really a, uh, you're, you're, you're totally deracinated. You're cut off from any, any history, any historical perspective on, on a particular way of life uh, that you have as an American, or even, even in your particular region, you know, as a person from where I am, you know, in the upper Midwest or from a person from the South, all the, all the cultural expressions that, that exist, all of that is supposed to be stripped away. You're just supposed to be a mere human being that enjoys star Wars and, 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 and the next, you know, current thing and the next product to consume. Um, that's, that's what they, they want you to be. That's like the idealized vision of, of what a human being is, is not really connected to any people or place or, or anything at all, just, um, producing and consuming and being a, a random, you know, blip on a, a spreadsheet. Right? Yeah. That's, so that's trash world. Right? Is this, is this, we're getting into another word you use, which is bug man. Yeah. which I kind of, I hear, and it's like the NPC. Yeah. Is this yeah. the type of atomized individual when you use that word bug man? Is that what it's talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Really. That's, that's what it is where it's, it is. I mean, you think of like, you know, for those that are familiar with like the internet, um, you think of like the Redditor, um, the guy who just, um, who he, I mean the internet lingo, and this is where I take it from. It's not, you know, unique to me, um, is, that it's it's a man who lives like a bug, like like an insect. Um, that he just goes scurries away to his pod, you know, con consumes and consumes until he dies, right? That he has, um, that he is this de-souled individual. There's no soul there. I mean, obviously, in like uh, Christian theological terms, yeah, human beings have souls, of course, but right. Uh, but the 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 soul, the the, the this you know, animating principle in in, in inside him has been stripped away, right? There is no, he doesn't think of himself as part of a people with a, you know, collective uh, vision and goals and, and existence. Um, he is just a, an isolated node in a, in a, in a machine, right? That's, right. that's all he is. Like he doesn't, he doesn't have, um, even, even, even in terms of like family, he doesn't really have a deep connection to family or he doesn't have a, a uh, any plans for posterity, Right. Uh, if he does have children, they're just little bugs that are going to go do their little bug things too. They're not, there's no vision for, for them as a people beyond this. And, and they're, you know, perpetuating their, their existence. Um, and so it is, um, yeah, just this totally isolated atomized man that's alone and knows he's alone and, and copes with his, um, honestly, very miserable situation by, by the antiseptic of, of, entertainment and, and, you know, pornography and, and, you know, um, drugs and booze and things like that. Like that's, that's, that's all he exists for, right? Just yep. fleeting, fleeting pleasure, uh, intermittently throughout his life. And then he dies. 
right? That's, yeah. that's what the bug man is. And, it, and so he doesn't really care about things. Although they'll care about like the things that they're programmed to care about. Yes. So like whatever yeah. the current thing is, like he'll change his Instagram profile picture to be a black square and then a Ukraine flag and then, a, or then a mask and then, you know, star of David or whatever, like whatever the current thing is, like he'll receive his programming from the TV or, or whatever, uh, because you want to just be a good bleeping human being. Right. And, yeah. and like that, that's, that's all he has, right. That's, that's all he has. There's no independent thought whatsoever. There's no, and there's no reflectivity on, on, on anything deeper. Um, that's, that's the other, you know, um, aspect of these people. I don't really get into it in the book so much, but they, um, they're, they're basically anesthetized from like the realities of the world. They don't think about life and death and, or the great beyond or any, anything like this. Um, they, they live for the moment. Their morality is, is programmed for them. What is right and wrong and good. They, they don't question it. Um, and, and, uh, the irony of it, of course, is like every single one of them believes that they are independent thinkers and free thinkers and, and that they arrived at all the positions that they believe entirely in isolation. Yep. And it just so happens to agree with everything the people that rule over them say right yeah so it's, that, that's how they are it's like oh i'm an independent thinker i'm like well give me a, an example of something you conflict with the rest of the culture on so with the bug man the, i'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself but the, this is something that that's coming up in my mind is like you know for a lot of evangelicals the the idea and we'll talk about revivalism and evangelism because you address that in the yeah. book but for a lot of evangelicals it's hard for people, it's hard for them to conceive of a population that is so kind of um, soulless in a sense, even though, like you said, they have souls, they're real people. So I guess if you were to kind of lay out a vision for how do you evangelize the bug man? Like, how do you reach yeah. these people? And that's because that's really hard. Like that's, it's yeah. hard. One, it's hard to grasp, but like so much of the population is so uh, programmed just based on media and food and all these kind of things. Like what uh, <laughs> the temptation for a lot of evangelicals is like, you know, we need to, we need to bring the terrorists next door because then they're closer and we can preach the gospel to them, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so like, when Good you think luck. about the bug man, you think about the people in your life that are kind of NPCs, what does it look like to reach them with the Boniface option in mind? Yeah, I think, um, well, one, it's, you, you have to admit the degree of difficulty. Like these are people that have been socially conditioned and, and socially engineered to live this way. And it, it's, it's, they've been programmed from birth to live in this manner and think that it's, it's totally fine, totally normal. And their, their world is totally fake, um, and, and prepackaged for them in every conceivable way. And, and so you, you have to confront it and challenge it. You can't just try to like contextualize the gospel in a way that they can, you know, have it as another thing to consume, right? That's the typical evangelical mode. And, totally. and you know, we, we talked about this before we went on air. It's like the, the typical evangelical mode is to make it like Instagram church or TikTok church, where you have this extremely high production value and it just, it turns into another product to consume. And that's, that's the, the standard operating procedure of evangelicalism in, in this era is is to try to contextualize things in a, in in a way to meet these people uh, where they're at, and and the reality is no, you have to confront them because you're just you're just replacing like you know an hour of porn for an hour of church, like that's yeah. what you're doing or whatever. Like it's not, um, it is you're you're not fundamentally transforming their worldview and way of life and, and reorienting them to a, a Christian way of life. You're just adding another part of the, into their pantheon of consumption. And, and so you have to challenge it. You have to say, no, your, your entire world is fake and gay. Like you, <laughs> you, you can't, right. You cannot, um, it's, it's, it, it, and it's miserable. Like it's a really miserable way to live is just, oh man, I can't wait until the next season of the Mandalorian comes out and I'm going to, you know, we'd be so excited for that. Like, no, like that's, that's how these people live and yeah. you need to show them like, no, this is pathetic. This is not yeah. how God designed you to, to live. He didn't, I mean, some of it, you know, even like recently the controversies on <laughs> online have been like, oh, there's no mandate in the Bible. Show me the chapter or verse that says you need to go lift weights. And right. it's like, uh, we have the fattest, like literally the most obese generation ever. 
and weakest and, and the lowest testosterone in in recorded history and and there's a reason why like they want you to be sick and fat and weak uh, because you're easy to manipulate and rule it, it it completely messes up your bi- biology and your your mental uh, health uh, they want you to be depressed and and the, it's the same thing if all you are living for is you know the next you know marvel movie or whatever like that is that's a pathetic way to live and you just right. need to say it like this is pathetic and it's and it's not saying that like oh you can't have hobbies or like movies even though they're really dumb uh but like you, you you're not even saying that like you yeah if you like stuff cool whatever but sure. if you're if your reason for existence is to consume this stuff you should then you, and and you're totally depressed and anxious and you should ask yourself why yeah right? it isn't just like well i have a chemical imbalance in my brain well, maybe you do you know right but why is that there like that's right. not normal yeah. Right? Why, why does everybody have that? You know? Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's, right. it's because all of the things that God has given human beings to make life worth living, to make life, um, uh, good and, and wholesome and pleasurable and, and deep and rich, all of that has been stripped away from you. And all you have is, you know, stuff animated by CGI, yep. right? That's, that's life to you now. And so, yeah, no, it's no wonder you're, you're depressed. Of course you, it's I'm surprised more people aren't right. It is, that's what's going on. And so like, you have to confront that. And that's the thing we don't want to do. We want to just keep people happy and never, never offend them or step on their toes or anything like that, because we want to be just another product to consume rather than challenge the challenging the entire, you know, of uh, landscape right? yep. and, and, and just tearing it all down. Right. We don't yeah. want to do that because that's, <laughs> that's hard. You sound like a radical and an extremist. Uh, yeah. So, and and whatever. for many pastors, they won't confront it. I think ultimately because they're more concerned about the finances and the budget of the yeah. people in their church leaving. And, uh, and it, that's a real deal. I'm not saying oh, yeah. you, know, you shouldn't take into consideration being able to provide for your family, but like, dude, it's got, it's captured a lot of pastors, this idea that, you know, the best thing I can do is reach the most people. And then it just so happens that I can, you know, have a, have a decent life. Maybe pastors aren't paid well in general, but at least I can survive and say, I'm doing the Lord's work. And, um, you know, if I upset the wrong people, they're going to leave. And that's really going to hurt me personally, hurt my family, but pastors have to figure out how to get, get over that. I don't know why, you know, something that ticks on me. I just, that, that's never why I got into ministry, you know? And so I know me too. uh, I I I can't do it. I can't, no, I just, I can't. I, I, I can't do it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I said, I said something like this on, on Twitter, you know, the other day where it's like, dude, if I, cause there, there were people, you know, saying like, oh, the Christian nationalists, they want power and they want to take over and have power. And, and like, and, and Stephen Wolf, you know, is like, uh, then we're doing it the wrong way because yeah. if I wanted power, I would just say everything David French does. Totally right? do. <laughs> and Russell Moore does. <laughs> like, and, and it's like, if I wanted to, you know, be, have a big giant mega church and have tons of influence in the church. I, I could do that. Sure. Right? Easily. Like I could, I could just go in and weasel my way in and say whatever anybody wants me to say. And I could do, I could do the TikTok church and the Instagram church and I could wear the skinny jeans and, and do all of that. You know, now, now I can, uh, I've lost, I've lost some weight. <laughs> um, and <laughs> it's like, um, and it's and like, I could, I could do all that stuff. I could be Steven Furtick. You know, I could be, um, um, or like, you know, one of the, you know, boomers that is, you know, in, in charge of some of these big churches, like I could do all that stuff. Like, it's not hard, you know, it doesn't require like uh, 180 IQ, right. right? You just, you, it's easy to tell people what they want to hear totally. and, and cash the check, yeah. right? It's much, much harder to tell the truth. And, and when you see these things happening. Right. You see the way of the world and see the the world that we live in and how comfortable we are with it um, to just, you know, uh, you know, it's easy for them to ignore it um, or just not not see it entirely. But I, I can't do that. I have I, I see it and I have to say something. Right. I have to totally. like, No, this is bad. And we, we need to see how bad it is and how it how it is designed to rob us of our soul. Right. Yeah. That, that is it, it, like designed. It isn't like, uh, Oh, just the inexorable process of history. And just so happens that we have this hyper consumerist, uh, deracinated individualist, isolated society. No, like they, they want it this way. They want right. us to live this way uh, because it, I think ultimately like it attacks the church, 
right? The, the church is, um, is this thing that gives, um, civilization its stability now in, in the new covenant. And, um, if, and if you eat out the, the foundation of a civilization and strip that away, um, then it's easy to manipulate and rule people like bugs in a hive or like, like drones in, in, in the Borg or whatever. Like that's, that's how they want people to be. Yeah. Well, how do you, uh, you know, cause a lot of this comes up in the book and, and I, you know, the first three chapters, I was like, there's a lot of, uh, it's first of all, like it's a quick read once you get through it, but you're using a lot of internet lingo. Yeah, and so yeah. it's almost like I need a, a lexicon, you know, in the back <laughs> of the book or something. Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious, how do you stay like you used the word current year uh, one time and made me laugh out loud because I was like, I, I know exactly what he's talking about. But how do you stay so current with like the internet lingo and the slang? Are you just on Twitter all the time? Like, yeah, are, well, is there a dictionary you're pulling from? What is that? No, I mean, some of it is it's just kind of like meme language or whatever. And, and and part of it is, yeah, I resisted the urge to put a lexicon in there because it kind of it robs it of, of some of its power. Fun. Yeah. Um, and, and because like the point of memes is like, no one tells you what it means. You figure it out. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and that's part of like humor is sometimes you're not going to get a joke and that's what makes jokes good is not everybody gets it. Right. Um, and, and when you do, it's like, Oh, that's hilarious. Right. That's, that's part of like just, you know, meme language in general. And, and there's enough context there that I think most people could figure out, you know, what bug man means or what uh, yeah. current year means. Like, I think you can figure that. So I didn't, I didn't try to, get too deep in the weeds and use really obscure <laughs> internet lingo. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, no, I, I wanted it. Um, yeah. I wanted it to say those things. And that's even, you know, when I, when I went over with, with my editor, he's like, are you sure you want to keep that in there? I'm like, no, nah, people will figure it out. It's okay. No, they'll like, figure I'm it not, out. I'm not going to insult their intelligence by like putting a footnote. <laughs> in there Bug man means. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the beginning I did, I did like in, in the, in the prologue, um, yeah, I did uh, explain like, okay, what is trash world? What is yep. fake and gay, right? And, and I, I wanted to do that because it's not just like this pejorative where it's like you're a you know a junior high school kid calling everything gay. Right. Um, I wanted to, to show that no, like the reality is, I mean, this is what like uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, the the libertarian uh, scholar, got fired from his you know, job at UNLV over because he 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 like wrote about um, how. Um, in in a hyper consumerist society, like the the homosexual is is the ideal man because he doesn't have offspring naturally, and is is con concerned with um, the current the present. So his his time preference, to use like economic terms, is as heightened as possible because he's he you know um, live today and and die tomorrow. Right. That's that's the entire um, way of existence. And so what Trash World does is it it forces people into the same mode where it's like, oh, I'm going to buy everything on credit and I'm going to live it up right now. And, you know, consequences, um, you know, be damned. I'm going to just live it up and not care about the future. Well, that's that's how everybody lives. Right. Yep. That's how everybody lives now. And so it's in that sense, not just like this pejorative, like uh, it's all gay, uh, but rather it's it's modeled after after homosexual lifestyle right that's right. that's that's what i mean by it and so it's i'm sure some people read that and be like oh no that game can't talk that way um and it's like well no there's there's actually like a, a much deeper meaning to it than just um schoolyard you know bullying yeah um, so yeah so a, a lot of it is yeah using and and like using internet lingo meme language or whatever i think um it conveys ideas, you know, better, um, in, in a potent, you know, uh, powerful way. And, and of course, you know, 10 years from now, people maybe read it and like, that's so dated and old. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the thing I was more concerned with. It's like, Oh, I'm going to sound sure. like, I'm going to sound totally cringe, man. In 10 totally. years, in 10 but... <laughs> years you're going you're to be like, okay. Okay. Millennial. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, all right. Let's talk about in your book, because, uh, a big emphasis in the book is on the household. Really appreciate that. Um, men and women. And I think you just do a really wonderful job of kind of painting the picture there, especially for men. Um, one thing you highlighted was American revivalism. And so I wanted to talk about that because I think for most evangelicals, like even when I've, uh, you know, put online or talked with people about 
the revivalist revivalistic culture of evangelicalism it's a very kind of sacred cow you know oh, yeah. a lot of a lot of church people are very obsessed with revival revival's got to be the way forward yeah. it's kind of got to be the way culture changes um and you know we don't need to get into like you know wolf's approach is not revivalistic whereas wilson's Ooh. approach in mere christendom is a little revivalistic it kind of mm -hmm. you know at the end and people can go back and listen to my interview with him I talk, yeah. we talk about that. And, and those are just two different approaches, two different flavors, but in the broader evangelical landscape, I mean, revivalism is like everything. Oh, yeah. And so tell, tell me why we should either be suspicious on revivalism, you know, to put it, to put it in a harsh way. Why do you hate revivalism, Andrew? <laughs> like help people understand where you're coming from there and to understand kind of this broader narrative that we've been fed. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Doug. Doug would probably uh, vehemently dispute uh, any <laughs> any sympathy for revivalism whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I I think I mean a lot of it is that, and and, and I mean our our culture is is individualistic, and so the the mindset of the church. I mean, it's it is everything is downstream from 1789, right? Everything is downstream from from Rousseau and and the French Revolution. And so that, that is our entire anthropology. That's how we think about everything is that we're, we're mere individuals. We all have religious liberty and we can all make up our own decisions and everything else. And that there should be this neutral secular public square. And, and so the background is, is that America, you know, American religion is very democratized where it's like, it's, it's just this populist thing where um, you just get the masses going and, 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 and get them riled up to be Christian. Right. And that's how you affect change. Right. Um, and, and so that's like baked into the cake. Like that's how we, that's how we think, that's how we operate. And, and like downstream of that is, you know, some of the stuff we've, we've talked about a little bit that um, then your, everything that you do, right. Every operation of the church is optimized to um, produce conversions and get numbers. Um, and so even including like how you approach doctrine, right. Um, all of those things will be sent. I mean, you see this with, uh, like Andy, Andy Stanley, like the last couple of weeks where it's like, well, we got to get with the times guys and be open to homosexuality and blah, blah, blah. And, 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 yep. and it's like, they'll, the, because of the revivalistic impulse, like we got to win people and this is where the people are at. Right. Um, or you have like that video I and mean, I guess it's old, it's a couple of years old of like JD Greer, Greer, um, who, who was like, well, yeah, we've got, we got women in the church who work at abortion clinics. And it's like, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we got to be all things to all people, you know, it's like this, is this, and it's like, and, and so it, it causes them not to draw lines anywhere. Um, and, and it's a disaster. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. And, 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 and then it, 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 it affects like you, you talk to an evangelical and be like a typical evangelical person, you know, that, that means well is, is a, a, a faithful Christian loves the Lord. And you ask them, well, why, why do you worship the way you do? Right. Why, right. why do you, why is the worship service structured the way that it is? And, you know, they'll tell you, well, this is what brings people in. Right. Uh, eventually like they'll get to that point. Like that'll be the, the, rationale right this is what gets people to come to church right we got to have good music we got to have a message it can't be too long and it has to you know be really um you know they wouldn't say this but like really watered down and really basic and not really say much of anything but be very positive and uplifting and that that's the mode of church because that's how you get people in and and that's what drives everything every single thing is what brings in people what brings in numbers and and I mean, especially after the collapse of like mainline denominations in the, in the beginning of the 20th century uh, and onward, um, it, it's, it's become this like you know, market share thing where, where it's like, we're going to try to gobble up the market share here. And it, it turns into this, you know, cor very corporate uh, managerialist uh, system where you're, you're just trying to compete for market share and do marketing and, and, and all of that stuff. Like you, like you're, you know, working at a fortune 500 company, right. You, and you treat it that way and you just treat it like a product for people to consume. And so that, so like that, that mode, which really began in the, in the um, early to mid 19th century of revivalism 
that that's what spawned it. You know, you, you have guys like Charles Finney um, who that's what he did. Like his, his whole shtick was I'm going to gin people up with these really riling, you know, really stirring emotional uh, presentations and that'll bring people in, right? The most important thing is, is get, just getting uh, numbers, getting, getting conversions. Like that's really what matters. Not, not the doctrine of the church, not the church's worship, not uh, discipleship of, of people, not, um, you know, uh, building faithful communities, you know, just getting numbers, getting conversions. And, and you see that, like I was in a campus crusade. They don't call it that anymore because, you know, they went woke, yeah. uh, but I was at campus crusade in college. And that was like the, totally the model is we just gotta, we gotta get numbers on the board, right? That's what we got to do. We got to, you know, do gospel presentations and, and get people to pray their prayer. And then that's all that matters. And, and even then, like I didn't have a very sophisticated understanding of, of theology or the history of the church or where, why things were the way they were, but it always, it always bugged me where it's like, and I wasn't against evangelism at all, but it always bugged me because it's like, I would see people, you know, come to our meetings and stuff that I know were like, um, you know, going out and getting drunk on the weekend and then they'll come to our meetings and it's like, we're not, you know, discipling these people at all. Like they don't know what it means to be a Christian other than to like show up to a meeting once a week and, and maybe go to a Bible study. And we're not, we're not teaching them anything about the Bible or about how to live as a Christian. And, but that, and, and I, I thought, well, maybe that's just college. Maybe that's just the way, you know, it is here, but uh, at the church at large, it's not that way. Right. And it is, <laughs> it it is. like, that was just, you know, a cross section of, of how it is uh, generally. And um, that is something I think, you know, as we, as we fully are in negative world, like a neutral world, like that totally worked, right? In positive and neutral worlds. I don't know if, you know, your audience is familiar. You've had Aaron, Aaron Ren on. Yeah, he that. came and talked about that. So yeah. you can go listen to that. If you're a listener, you can go listen to the episode yeah. I had with him. Yeah. And so it, it, it like, that works in positive and, and neutral world, right? Where there's either a benefit to being a Christian socially, or um, there isn't a negative to being a Christian socially, right? That, that works. Um, you can, you can, you know, operate that way. But now we're in a world where there is, no positive benefit really in, in, in like a, in social terms and cultural terms to being a Christian. And so um, just having a consumable product um, isn't really going to do it for people right? going yeah. forward. And, and so I think, and, and you see this like um, you know, like Michael Foster has talked a lot about this and, and what has occurred in the church um, after 2020 and how many people like when the lockdowns happened, a lot of people just never went back to church that had been going regularly. And I, I think some of it, and it isn't just like the, the people that are ex evangelicals and, and leaving evangelical. I think that's actually a very small segment of like angsty, bitter people that just um, are angry that people told them that they sinned. Um, and I think that's a really small, you know, it's loud, but it's, it's a very small number a lot of it is just people that like, well, there's really no benefit to this to me. Like, ah, yeah, it, it makes me feel better going to these services, I guess. But I'd rather just have my Sunday morning of my, my, my one morning I get to sleep in. I'm just going to sleep in and watch the NFL. Like, right. That's, I think, is what has happened. Yeah, like, totally. People see and... no real benefit to it. And, and because they're not really getting anything uh, deep and meaningful from church other than maybe relationships and, and, and a network of, of, of people and, and friends, but they're, they're, they're not getting much out of it. There is no, um, there, there's nothing to, to, to really grab hold of. Like they're not getting Bible, um, taught to them. Like that's for Bible studies and other things if they want to do that, but they're not getting that on Sunday morning. They're not getting, you know, worship that is, <clears throat> you know, transcendent. Uh, unless the band is really good, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, they're not they're not getting any any type of uh, worship that that looks anything like Christian worship over the millennia, um, and and so I think people just don't see the need for it, and that's why they've just stopped going. Yeah. And and so the opportunity exists for like people like us to give them something real and meaningful and, and something they can sink their teeth into. And that's, I think going forward, that is going to be the reality is um, unless your church is like really church and they're, they're, you're actually preaching the Bible and, and discipling people and teaching them, um, you know, the, the Christian way of life. 
and and you're worshiping in a um in a very you know sober and I hate to word, use the word authentic, um, but uh, and I, I use it in the book kind of in a, in a pejorative way, like because that's just a marketing term at this point. Um, but but in, in a real meaningful sense, where you are um, actually coming near and going before the Lord in in a real way. And if you're not getting that, um, then um, there's really no reason to go. And and so if you provide people that. And they they get they get something out of it. They actually they actually have a true genuine Christian experience, and they're they're really digging into the Word of God. And it's treated it's not just treated as this something silly or you just attach a Bible verse onto a TED talk, where it is you're expounding what the Scriptures actually say, and you're you're treating you know God's Word with reverence. Right, that's meaningful for people, and it's like oh, this is actually church, right? And so I think. That is the the way of the future, you know. Even even, you know. But even if it wasn't, even if we were stuck in neutral world for the next five hundred years, um, that's what I would do anyway, <laughs> because it's like this is what I believe, you know. Um, yeah. But I, I think it, it, neutral world was something that was never going to hold up, um, ever, and just just by the very fact of its existence. And so now we're we're entering a world where people need to be equipped to confront the harsh realities of a world that is antagonistic toward the Christian faith. And, and if you're not doing that and not preparing people this way and not, not stealing their spines um, for the confrontation ahead of them, then you're, you're doing them a disservice and you are, you, you're harming them. In a, in a yeah. Very, and I think with the, the revivalistic critique is really important because so many evangelicals are trapped in the mindset of neutral world and their, their basic mindset is I'm going to choose a church that, that still gets me some respectability and yeah. if this church would harm my public respectability, then I need to bounce and find one that's more respectful. And eventually you have to realize they're going to call every church a Christian national church. They're going to call every church that preaches the word a yeah. cult or whatever word they want to come yeah. up with to yeah. malign you so that you never go again. And so you've got to kind of break out of that. And with revivalism particularly, it's an interesting uh, sacred cow to chop down because if you were to design a version of... Christian spirituality that fit hand in glove that was like programmed to fit in the NPC mind. Yeah. Like the revivalistic TikTok church mindset is it like it's, yeah, it's like absolutely. goes perfectly with the consumeristic mindset where we've got to appeal to a broad audience, get them, get the most that we can consume. We've got to feed them a soundbite that they can feel good about and then mm -hmm. send them on their way. And so I just think it's a really important uh, conversation that I don't think a, a lot of American evangelicals maybe even aren't ready to have, but they need to be having it. It's kind of like what you talked about when you talked about questioning the 19th Amendment. And I love that example <laughs> because I've done that in conversations with people. And uh, sometimes it goes well. Some, like even my wife, like it, it didn't go well when I brought it up, you know, <laughs> but it's sometimes important... it go, I'd like to hear about the times it went well. You know? Yeah, no, some, <laughs> sometimes people are like, OK, because you, you bring up the important point, And when you're discussing that is like it's a, it's about trade offs. You know, if, if I told you we could get rid of genital mutilation and chopping kids private parts off, if we got rid of this, would you do it? And it's yeah. just a, it's an interesting tactic in our uh, our current moment and not even like like you just highlighted it's not even about our current moment or contextualizing it's a, it's about faithful christianity historic christianity that's rooted that's grounded with a particular people in a particular place yeah. and i just think it's a better way not just a better way i think it's a more true and honest way yeah. to do church and and disciple people into christianity one of the things going back to kind of the bug man discussion that we had earlier mm -hmm. and uh well, this is kind of in the last chapter of the book, and this is something I've really tried to teach people on, is a lot of these people are not good faith uh, you know, interlocutors. They're not, they're not people that you can just have a, a friendly debate about. And this is something that broke in my mind in 2020, 2021, yeah. when I saw the Veritas Forum cancel Neil Shinvey. Neil Shinvey, who's I've had on the podcast, but he's kind of notoriously like going to like play a little bit of the middle. And thankfully, he wrote a good yeah. book against critical theories, but like he's not like hardline right wing dude. But no. they cancel him, you know? <laughs> no, and so, not. like, I think that broke that broke me out of that paradigm of, of, yeah. of people ha being willing to have a good faith discussion. How would you help and pastor people? How would you kind of explain to people, like, you know, because it's still so easy for many Christians to go, like, well, they're just people like me. And if we can just ha sit down and have a, you know, go to coffee 
and, and have a good discussion, then, then maybe I can start planting gospel seeds in there. How would you kind of challenge that narrative? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's something where we are conditioned to believe that we're in this very free society where um, everyone has a seat at the table and you can, yeah, you can have these good faith discussions. And at the end of the day, we're all Americans and maybe we'll agree. Maybe we won't. Um, and that world doesn't exist, right? That doesn't, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, if it ever did, um, you, you should look at it like, okay, imagine you're a Christian in Pakistan, right? Uh, how would you go about living, doing evangelism, you know, uh, going about your life, right? That's how you need to think of it. Right, you are in a negative world. You are in a world where being a Christian comes with a cost, and and, and, it, and it doesn't mean that. Like, I mean, um, from whatever, like, there's a ton of evangelism happening in Pakistan. Lots of lots of people becoming Christian in in these Muslim countries, and and so it doesn't preclude, you know, that evangelism is possible. It's not. It's not saying that like, no, that's a, you can't do it. Like, they're just not going to listen to you. It's the mode is completely different where you are, you are dealing with people that are predisposed to hate you. And um, you have to approach it from that perspective, not like they're these neutral people that are just tabula rasa, um, empty vessels that they just, they just don't know the truth yet. And here I am going to give them the truth. And they're just, they're, they're totally empty vessels ready to receive it. It's like, no, they're, they're full vessels filled up with something that hates you. And uh, whether, the, whether they would frame it that way or not, like they, they do. And, and so you have to approach it that way where it's like, yeah, you're, you're dealing with someone that um, already despises everything you believe. And so how do you go about persuading them, right? How do you go about preaching the gospel to people like that? Um, it's different. It's not the same, right? It's, it's a very different um, approach, very different um, thing. And, and you really have to break down the, 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 the idols in them and, and the mental strongholds that they have. And yet, yeah, I try to do that in this book. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I bring up the 19th Amendment not to be like provocative, or controversial for controversy's sake, but just the question of like, there was a time where everybody was in agreement that like women shouldn't vote. So why did they think that way? Right. What, and was there any wisdom in that? Right. It's a forbidden question. Was there right. any wisdom in that? Like, or, or were they just these evil cavemen that, that hated women and just horrible misogynists? Right. And if they aren't, Right. If you could, you, you could, you could think, well, why did they do this? Why did they, why did they not have universal democracy for every single person? Right. Um, then, then you can begin to have a conversation about just um, the idea of democracy in general, the idea of the, the way our society is structured, um, the distinctions between men and women that used to exist. Um, why did, why did they view men and women differently? Um, were they just these barbarians who, who thought women were stupid um, or, or did they have a different view of men and women that we do? Um, and, and begin to, I mean, a lot of it is I use the analogy of Chesterton's fence and, and the 20th century, really the, when trash world's created is this century of just ripping down every Chesterton's fence we could, you know, we could find. And then never asking why was that fence there to begin with? Right. Um, I remember, I remember being in, in college in a, um, I had, I had one history professor that I thought was really good. Uh, I, I had studied history. And we, it was a British history class and all of the innovations that took place over the 19th century and, and 20th century in England, all of the progressive, um, uh, you know, uh, victories that were won, you know, as, as during this, this Whiggish march through a history of, of everything getting better. Right. Uh, he said, well, there were people that were against it. And so you're going to do a research paper, um, trying to understand why were they against this or that law? Right. Well, whether it's women's suffrage or whether it was, um, you know, like the corn laws and, and, and just whatever, you know, they're are growing or expanding democracy, things like that. Like all, why, all of these things that we think were victory. Why were people against it? Right. They aren't there. They weren't monsters. Um, why were they? Against, so I, I remember studying this and thinking like, whoa, they, people had like arguments. They, they weren't <laughs> just they weren't just these um, Neanderthals, like they had, they had arguments against this stuff. And it, and I almost, you know, even in, in those days when I was still, you know, a denizen of trash world, like I was starting to be convinced. <laughs> like, I'm like, Oh, maybe there is some wisdom there. You know, I don't know. Maybe they were right. Yeah. Um, and, and so like you begin to do that, you begin to 
cause people to ask, well, how do people used to live? And because they, in a lot of ways, yeah, okay, they didn't have antibiotics and iPhones and things like that. Um, and, and so you get people past their chronological snobbery that, that in current year, we're, we're way superior to people 100 or 200 years ago. Um, they had much more, they had richer, much more meaningful lives than we do. And what about the things that changed, uh, changed that, right? Um, and so like, if you could break those things down uh, for the, the NPC or the bug man, um, that I think is, is, is where you do it is, is showing them that like your life is miserable and awful and really pathetic. And I don't know how you get out of bed in the morning. And <laughs> it's like, right. there's a better way to live. There's a better totally. way to live. You could have it and it'll, yeah. you, your life will be so much better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be married and have a family. It's good to be part of a church and a community of people that want to live this way and to have a, a particular unique way of life that is, you know, um, standing completely against the way of the world. Um, yep. that, that, that's actually good and rich and meaningful. It's hard, uh, especially in the, in the current conditions, but it's way better way better than the, this, whatever this is. You yeah, know? totally. So in the last chapter, I, uh, I will confess I was, I was finishing it last night and when I started your book, it's kind of a black pill. It's kind of like, Oh gosh, yeah. this is really depressing. <laughs> you know, you're describing yeah. like how bad everything is. But by the yeah. end of the book, I got done with the book and I just, I just got down and I did some push ups. I was listening <laughs> to some like soundtrack music. I was just fired up. So you, at the, you know, one of the last lines is like, we're going to win which I love. Yeah. Give me, give me some like, okay, how, why should we be encouraged? What's the way, I mean, we've talked about it slowly throughout the podcast, but why is, why should we have an optimistic, hopeful attitude? Not just because Christ is the propitiation for our sins and we have hope in yeah. him, but also for kind of cultural renewal and reformation. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, ultimately things cannot continue going on the way that they are forever. Like God has designed a universe in a world to function in a particular way and everything, every part of our way of life is just running totally contrary to that. And so it, it can't, you know, what, what can't go on forever won't. And, and I mean, and you see it like the most obvious example is like transgenderism and things like this, where it's like, it's just so contrary to how God created the world. And, but then it's everything else. It's, it's, you know, trying to swim upstream with every aspect of life. And we've been able to do that because um, after the second world war, the United States was, was massively blessed with well, one being like the only country on the planet that had a functioning economy. And, and we, you know, generated massive wealth that lasted for several generations. That's now running out and um, you could afford to live insane in this insane way, uh, when, when, you know, you're rich enough to do it. Like you, you can see this in an individual, like, um, you know, the rock star can, can, um, can, you know, uh, have all the hookers and cocaine he wants and keep on kicking. Like the Rolling Stones are still alive, um, somehow. And like, you can keep living that way, but eventually it runs out, right. Eventually it runs out and you, you, you come back to reality and, that I think is going to happen. It's going to be harsh. It's not, I mean, like the black pill, you know, don't take it, but it, it, it's easy to be black pilled because you see, you, you see us rapidly returning to reality. And, and I mean, just even in like the geopolitical sense, like all of the, the entire world is erupting. The, the, you know, American hegemony over the world is, is, is faltering. And, um, you know, everyone's like, Oh, is there going to be world war three? I don't know. You know? And it's like, I, 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 who know who who knows what will happen, but there there certainly is you know chaos and instability all throughout the world, and a lot of that is because the United States no longer is is as powerful as it once was, and and so um, how does how does this play out over the next you know forty or fifty years? I I think um, times are going to get tough economically, um, things are going to be um, much more difficult for people, and you're you're going to, we're, we're going to come back to reality you can't, you can, you can spend, um, you know, 
twenty thousand dollars or or thirty thousand dollars a year to keep like homosexuals alive that have AIDS. Like that, I mean, a major part of our economy, and, and like all, and transgenderism too. Like they have to be on a course of antibiotics to keep the open wounds going. I don't want to get too graphic, but like it's a big money maker, right? And, but it's like that money's going to run out, and you can't you you're not going to be able to do this stuff forever. Um, and so. Yeah, I think and in every aspect of the insanity, you know, I mean, people bring up like the bread and circuses and all of this kind of stuff. It's interesting that like um, the moment I knew that that the I mean, I knew it before this, but where it solidified that like the whole COVID thing was was um, mostly fake is when they still had an NFL season where it's yeah. like, OK, well, we're still going to have the NFL keep everybody under control. Uh, and so you're all happy. Um, but it's like eventually like that stuff runs out. Eventually you're not going to be able to keep populations pacified. Eventually all the entertainments are not, I mean, and there's already diminishing returns and the movies are as good as they used to be, all that kind of stuff. And like all of it runs out, like you're not going to be able to have a massive welfare state, um, like social security and Medicare and all this is going to go belly up, you know, within like the next 10 years. And, and so all of it's going to implode in, in one way, shape or form. It's not going to go on forever. And, and like with that in mind, you have to be building the things that will cause your people, your family, your church, your community, your local, you know, your local community um, to survive whatever is around the bend. And, you know, honestly, and, and I think there's a big white pill in there because, right, if you are already building those things now and, and building real um, meaningful human community where you interact with people in real life and not just on the internet, uh, like we are right now. Um, if you're doing that stuff, right, you're going to have something that can withstand what is to come. Like you're building things that are anti-fragile that when the, when the chaos hits and when things get crazier, uh, it's not even crazy yet, when it gets crazier than it is, um, you will have things that will help you to survive and, and people will come, come to whatever you have, right. You, you'll, it'll actually grow because you have something when everybody else has nothing, when they're all just random isolated individuals that have, they have no people and no place and nobody that cares about them right now. You have a, a, a people that, that do care about you right now. You have a, a real community that, that exists that you can be part of. Um, and so if you're building those things down, if you have a mind to the future with, with all of this, you, um, you'll be set up for whatever is to come. And it, and yeah, it, it could be extremely difficult. It could be very, very hard. Um, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but um, you're in a much better position than you are if you're just, you know, alone in your apartment uh, playing video games and, and ordering Uber eats uh, like, yeah. and, and just you're alone, right? Yeah. That, that you don't want to be in that position, right? You want right. to have people, you want to, you want to be part of something that, uh, will, uh, Lord willing, stand the test of time. Amen, brother. Well, that's, that's a good, uh, good place to end. I think, I think I was going to ask about how you teach this stuff to people in your church, but I think what we've discussed throughout about either how to reach the bug man or how to evangelize people or stuff like that. I think we've addressed that pretty well. Um, and so I just want to give you the opportunity, you know, if people want to buy your, your book, follow you, keep up with your work, where can people do that? Well, uh, thank you for having me on chase. Uh, I really, uh, Really, really appreciate it. Um, you can uh, find all of my content at uh, news.gab.com. You can find